Welcome to the ATP Project Show with your host Steve and Jeff, and we have Elisma Lambert with us today as well too. G'day, Elisma. G'day, Jeff. G'day, oh. Steve. G'day, Elisma. Oh, almost sound Australian. That was very good. <laughs> yeah. You G'day. little South African. Um, but what's what's what we're talking about today is endometriosis, and and Elisma, we wanted to have you on. Obviously, um, at two dudes talking about endo is probably not the best thing. I mean, we can. I mean, Steve's qualified too, qualified. but I think it's going to be better coming from yeah. from a um, a female. But um, and what I would say is a lady. Um, um, that's often more to Steve as a lady, yeah, but it's not absolutely. true. Um, but in terms of, Elizabeth, do you want to just explain a little bit about who you are and your background for those that might not know who you are? I mean, you've been a contributor and you've worked with us for years. I mean, we do a lot of work and some exciting projects that we're working on as well, mm, too. Absolutely. Which we too. But, um, Elisma, what's what's your background? Um, who do you talk to? Where do you go? I mean, I've heard that you're the one that sort of that coined as connects the dots. Yeah. But, you know, do you want to sort of talk about your, your background and, and sort of what your your – Expertise is? Yeah, so um, I'm a, a qualified naturopath, have been in practice uh, for 20 years or so. I've given my age away there probably, but um, yeah, I've been in practice for a very long time. Um, you're right that I am known as kind of like connecting the dots person um, because I look at um, disease, if you wish, or disorders or conditions from a, a big picture perspective in terms of, you know, um, how everything connects with each other, um, you know, by how our biochemistry is driving certain conditions, etc. So, um, whereas a lot of specialists look really at specific areas like either just the gut or the thyroid or the hormones, um, for me, everything is interconnected and that's how we need to look at the body. So, we need to kind of like consider people's genetics, people's biochemistry, they food, their environment, their stress level, their mental health, uh, their nutrition, everything kind of like influences everything. So that's kind of how I look at things. And that's also why I treat a, a huge variety of conditions. Uh, I'm not a specialist in a, a particular area. I see myself as a generalist. And so I do everything from infertility, hormonal conditions, mm -hmm. uh, chronic illnesses, yeah. um, you know, joint conditions, autoimmune disorders, um, mold illness, whatever. So, uh, it, for me, it's like it's it's irrelevant what the condition is. It's how did that person get there, and then let, you know, let's treat that. So and I guess that's a good way to, to, as much as you possibly can, remove confirmation bias. Because if you're a specialist in just hormones mm -hmm. or a specialist in just gut, and look, you know, mind you. Um, I guess, you know, if we believe Hippocrates, you know, all health starts in the gut, it's probably a good place, but you could be looking at all sorts of different expressions, I guess, of, of certain issues coming from that, right? But if you're a generalist, then it could be, you know, from the outside, mm. or it could be hormones or polymorphisms or whatever it could be. So that's helps to, I guess, remove, you know, as the old saying is, if, if you're just looking at something through this, if it doesn't fit, you try and make it fit. Yeah, so. well, there's that old saying, and I may bastardize a little bit, but if you've got a hammer, then everything it's looks like a nail, nail. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it keeps an open mind if you kind of like don't put people in boxes and what you think is kind of like wrong with them. Yeah. Um, so it's it's yeah. extraordinary. Oh, sorry. Extraordinary this morning. Elisma came in a bit earlier. We were just chatting. Like we're catching up. And, and she mentioned some stuff on endometriosis. I mean, it blew my mind already. Mm. So in five minutes of her being in the building, it blew my mind oh, with great. science. I well, love Steve, that. Steve, I'm going, I never thought of that. Wow. So <laughs> connecting the dots, it's like, yeah, well, you know. And this is going to be good news, I guess, for people that have been suffering with um, with endometriosis. And, and again, Steve, if you've been blown away. Yeah, I was blown away. By in five um, minutes. Elisma's research and understanding and, and, and potentially how you would treat that or, or yeah. we can sort of look at that. Uh, and the other thing lastly I was going to say, Elisma, as well too, last time we were talking, I know that you were saying that, you know, you were travelling around the, the globe, specifically in the US, where you've got a network where you, where, where you lecture and teach and talk and collaborate with, you know, everyone from, from naturopaths and nutritionists right up to, to doctors, integrated doctors, and also just standard doctors as well too, correct? That's co that's correct. Well, that was pre-C um, pre time. Pre-C? <laughs> Pre-C V19? That's right. Pre-C V19? Are, are, are we allowed to say that? I don't know. Don't know. But yeah, it was, anyway, we said it. it. Was, yeah, we said it. It yeah. was like, you know, before traveling became a little bit more arduous. Yeah. Uh, I was certainly doing that, you know. Uh, also, Europe, um, quite, a, quite a, a lot of lectures that I gave there as well so um um yeah that was like cool. very busy and and we've been in in entrusted a very special project to you as well too that you've been working with with mm. steve tony and myself on for quite some time now some deep dive studies yep. and we've yeah. done some um 
we've done some clinical trials. I mean, yes. it's pretty it's pretty exciting actually. And that's all right. So let's get onto it. Endometriosis. Yep. So guys, where do you want to start? Well, we we can start back in 18, 1927. You know the band 1927. That's when I think yes, the band. Yeah, yes, the yeah, album. I know the album. But I was, well, yeah. back in nineteen twenty seven. This is where do they you remember the band. 1927? You, you don't no, know what we're talking about. No, that's when I, I think of you. Yeah. It's all that. Oh, sorry. It's great Australian band back in 1990. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Around there. Yeah. Elizabeth's not old enough to remember that. No. Well, uh, also, you know, we don't listen. In South Africa, there wasn't Australian music. <laughs> so. What? <laughs> it's terrible. Oh, geez. Four things. <laughs> yeah, amazing. But back in 1927, there, this guy, uh, Samson, discovered that it, this, it coined the phrase endometriosis. And he called it. A South African. No, 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 the American guy. Oh, American. Yeah. Um, and and he, 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 he called it, this is Samson, okay, John Samson. He, he coined the phrase endometriosis and he thought it was caused by retrograde menstruation. Right. So if, if, you've, if, we've, if you can imagine a uterus sitting there, it's like a V-shaped thing and you've got the endometrium, the blood growing inside, waiting for the egg to come down to be fertilised, the menstruation then falls out the bottom. I'm keeping this very simple. But... In this case, it comes out the top around the ovaries and goes into the peritoneal cavity and throughout the body. It's even been found in the brain. Wow. So endometrium is supposed to be in the uterus. It's outside the uterus. That's what endometriosis is. Right. So it's, a, it's like, and that was 1927, and that's been the leading cause of what, now, now what causes that? There's a lot of risk factors, and we'll, we'll talk about those. But I'll just give you one risk factor um, is getting your period before the age of 11. Wow, okay. Is, is one. Um, and, 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 and could that be brought on by... Um, hormones. Uh, right, which is, again, we talk about xenoestrogens. Mm. Xenoestrogens. Like um, hormones. I mean, we're always worried about hormones in our food, like in, you know, chicken. I don't eat now see coals and that are hormone-free <laughs> chickens and hormone-free beef and yeah, that so sort of stuff. That's star. special. And it's like, well, that's what food's supposed to be, yes. hormone-free, right? right. right? Yeah. Um, did yeah. you know that all meat... It contains hormones anyway because it's of an animal. from the animal yeah. Right? yeah so cow's milk is concentrated hormones right so you have lots of hormones mm. testosterone estrogen in cow's milk mm. um that's one of the you know i'm not a big fan of cow's milk yep. but that's one of the reasons why but is, is, is the onset of um, uh, um females having their period earlier is that becoming more prevalent in today's society, or is it peaked and coming down? No, it's or? it's more prevalent now. Really? Um, yep, that it's going, and also having a menstrual cycle shorter than twenty seven days. I'm just reading off the list here. Right. And also, this is a weird one: being underweight. Right. Underweight increases your risk of endometriosis. You would think that that's probably on the decline. That. that yeah. One. Yes, well, it probably is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because um, people yeah, are becoming more, yeah. more, more fatter. I mean, as we... I think we can say that. And then they, they, women who get more obese typically end up with more androgens. Right. So like it's... Hirschitism. Yeah, hirschitism, yeah, yeah PCOS. So, Steve-O. Yes. Bars. I know, it's morning tea time. Absolutely. Well, what do we eat? Well, what's interesting, mate, is obviously the bars that we've been working on are hitting the shelves everywhere across Australia, which is awesome. It's awesome. So they are now available in... Um, Specialty, so that's all of your favourite local um, uh, 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 retailers. Yep, but also available at Woolworths as well too. Nice. Passionate love these bars, Steve. Oh. Twenty grams of protein. Yep. High in fibre. Yep. Natural flavours and colours. No dairy. No dairy. No gluten. Yeah. So what I about mean, sucralose? Full no, sucralose. no sucralose. Oh. Only only natural, non nutritive sweeteners that we use in there. Mm -hmm. um, small amount of uh, sugars that's in there is actually from the the Belgian chocolate, which is actually made here in Australia. Believe it or not, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Belgian chocolate, there, but it's was, great. It's okay, great. It, it tastes great. It, yeah, it, it, put it this way: it's like, it's made to Belgian standards. Oh, if that beautiful. makes sense, right? There we go. Um, but yeah, fiber in it. Uh, yeah, nine grams, Steve, oh on average. God. So, which makes up the nutritional gap, right? Yep. And the average person's normally about ten grams um, short. But it's a jelly like substance um if you guys listen to our podcast if you're familiar uh, with our products this is something we've been working on for a very very long time they've just hit the market now here in australia so get into woolworths and get into any of your good retailers we'll be stocking them now mm -hmm. um, the fresh is best so they've only got a relatively short shelf life on them um, but get in grab them while you can uh, because we will have supply because we've got so much demand for the bars which oh, is great steve great. That, that, think of it like a, a sort of like a turkish delight style mm -hmm. um like that so it tastes yeah beautiful 
They it, really it taste great. 20 grams of body balance collagen in them as well too so that we're not putting crappy stuff in there. Yeah. Most bars that you'll see out in the market, and look, I used to take the bars and I used to hate them because they're so full of maltitol and sorbitol which Ooh. cause havoc with your guts um, which is why we don't use those those sweeteners if you like. Yeah. Um, and, and again, they're not using whey or any form of, of protein that can denature. Mm. Collagen is very good for cooking and baking with because the, the protein strands don't denature. Correct. So again, give it a try, something a bit different. Um, and I know this sounds weird, but try the chocolate orange. It is really- It's nice. It's been crafted beautifully mm. by the team. It's yeah. got some natural orange essence in there as well too. So yeah. it's it's a little bit different, but yeah, uh, yeah give them a try. Uh, especially if you're looking for something sort of, um, you know, a bit naughty before bed. Oh, that sounds oh, wrong. Oh, um, But if you're looking for something, you know, while you're having your cup of tea or watching TV, yep. uh, great in between meals as well mm. too, or as a snack on the go, mm. um, give them a try. Yum. So what percentage of the population suffers from endometriosis, Steve? About 10 to 11%, depending on the status. Oh, so one reproductive in 10. Reproductive females. Yeah, reproductive. Right. That's huge, isn't it? One in 10. Wow. That's, that's f- phenomenal. And, you know, also having uh, n- one or no children is a risk factor. Right. Being Caucasian is a risk factor. Right. Um, being aged between 25 and 29. Um, drinking more than 10 grams of alcohol per day right. and women who are active smokers. It's 10 grams of alcohol. Oh, well, if you think of a can of beer with 5%, yep. okay, 5% of a can of beer is that that's 37 grams of alcohol. Oh, so just, wow, just that little amount. Yeah, well, that's a can of drink, you know, beer is a fair bit. Mm. You know, so, so, I mean, think of women don't drink that much mm. as compared to men, mm. but 10 grams of alcohol is not much, but it's, it's highly estrogenic. Mm. And and hormones play a huge role in this. And and you you were telling this morning about different receptors, the different sorts of receptors in endometriosis in sufferers, yeah. progesterone receptors. Yeah, because because we, we know that that one of the big driving driving factors for endometriosis is that imbalance between estrogen and progesterone. Now, it, this is where testing can sometimes become a little bit difficult mm. in a di- for a diagnosis of endometriosis because someone may have seemingly normal looking estrogen and progesterone but what they found is on this endometrial tissue that there's a lot less progesterone receptors and so if there's less progesterone receptors it means there's less spaces for progesterone to bind to progesterone only uh, anything in the body only initiates an action if it binds to a receptor Mm -hmm. and so if, when you have less receptors, you essentially have less progesterone, even even if you're producing enough progesterone because the message is not getting through. And so there is a, a, a huge issue with those progesterone receptors on this endometrial tissue, and then that exacerbates the whole problem because it, it, it emphasizes this huge difference between estrogen and progesterone. And then that in itself triggers off a whole other cascade. Um, that's the histamine cascade. I don't know if you want to get into that. that that's what blew me yeah. away this morning. Yeah. The, the link of histamine in this. So get into it. I love right. it. Right. So essentially now you That's end up with this like estrogen dominant state. Now what mm. estrogen does is estrogen increases the degranulation of mast cells. So mast cells, imagine them like these little balloons in the body and they're full of histamine and they stay in those balloons unless something happens to trigger, to make that balloon pop and then let all of this histamine out. And typically that happens when you have allergies, right? So you have pollen, it triggers, those balloons pop, you get the histamine, you get the runny eyes, the runny nose and all of that. But estrogen does the same thing. There's lots of histamine receptors in the uterus and lots of histamine enzymes in the uterus. So it's not all just about allergies and sinus and hay fever. And so what happens is if you have too much estrogen, as is the case in endometriosis, it makes these balloons, lots of these balloons pop and you just get this massive histamine release. Now histamine stimulates another uh, chemical, uh, VEGF, which... Oh, vascular endothelial growth factor. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what it does. It makes more blood vessels. It's, it stimulates a process called angiogenesis, which is really just making more blood vessels. So then all of these new more blood vessels are being made in the endometrium. It creates a proliferation. So it grows more of these, this endometrial tissue grows wherever it is in the body, whether it's inside or outside the mm. uterus. Um, and that histamine 
triggers the ovaries to make even more estrogen. Mm. And so it becomes this vicious cascade. And so you'll often find that a lot of women with estrogen dominant symptoms, such as endometriosis, also have a lot of histamine symptoms as well. There's a huge overlap in a lot of these symptoms because histamine also triggers cramping. So, um, you know, endometriosis typically has this um, severe abdominal cramping as one of the, um, as one of the symptoms. Mm. Uh, and that's, generally what histamine does. Mm. Um, so you you get all of these kinds of symptoms that can, you know, it looks like estrogen dominant symptoms, but a lot of it is actually histamine symptoms. It's just a consequence of this whole I estrogen it's dominance. Abso- absolutely incredible. So, so just quickly then, so I'm hearing, and from a lay person's point of view, then you're thinking, well, then maybe if I take antihistamines, that might help. Theoretically, yes. But now this is where it becomes a little bit interesting because there's different histamine receptors. There's um, there's more than just the four, but the main ones yeah. is H1, H2, H3, and H4. And Easy so different remember. histamine <laughs> receptors is in different different areas of the body. Mm. Now, I may be uh, incorrect, but I think it's H1 One. receptors yeah. in the uterus. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's H1 receptors. So if you're going to take an antihistamine, it needs to be an H1 receptor antihistamine, if you wish. So what are the ones like, um, and I won't mention any of the brand names, but the antihistamines, so like... What's the what's the chemical compound? Oh uh, yeah, that, the brain? Um, I can't remember the name but, of the chemical. But, you know, and you'd probably know them C and and yeah. Uh, Most of them F, are H one, H two. Yeah, H two. Um, yeah. the, the, these ones here. Um, but I actually don't think there's a problem with mentioning them really because we're not no. talking against them. But no. Finergan no, no, and yeah. Claritine, those yeah. are, in mm. Australia, I think. Well, well, well Finergan is an old classing one, which is a stronger one. The, the older antihistamines are actually stronger than the new ones because yeah. they cross the, the blood brain barrier. Yeah, right. and Benadryl. Mm. And they now, make you sleepy or not? They do. Yeah. Now, now a very common medication medication prescribed uh, pain medication because histamine is involved in nerve conductions of pains as well. So very common, uh, you know, you've heard of misinophen? No. Oh, it's, it's a prescription uh, pain medication. It's got paracetamol, you know what that is, codeine phosphate and a class one antihistamine. Right. And it's a very common pain prescription right. for people with endometriosis. So is that it's a, because that enhances the crossing of the blood brain barrier? Or? Uh, it also blocks histamine, which blocks um, pain signals. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. So it's a, antihistamines are used for pain. They're also used to sleep. Mm. Right. The old ones are, in fact, if you went to the pharmacy and they said, oh, I can't sleep, uh, you can get an anti old antihistamine and it's marketed now as a sleeping tablet. Wow, mm. okay. Mm. So so you're saying, though, that taking something like a Finergan or a, um, a Claritin or something like that, one of the old ones or mm. one of the new ones, isn't going to sort of affect the endometriosis because it's not targeting those cells down in the in the uterus? Or? Well, it can stop histamine binding to those receptors and maybe help with the cramping and all of that, but it doesn't stop the estrogen production, right? right? right. Estrogen will still make, uh, will still trigger more mass cell release and all of that. You're still going to have all this histamine floating around. They just won't be able to bind to the receptors. So ideally what you want to do there is you want to improve histamine breakdown mm-hmm. in the uterus, but most importantly, you want to find out, is there a source of, of histamine production Get in my body? Mm. So there's gut bacteria, as mm. we know, that are huge histamine producers. Right. Um, you know, stress will also cause a lot of histamine, you know, th- those balloons to pop and release more histamine as well. So a lot of that comes back to the old things, you know, healthy gut, mm. reduce your stress levels. Mm. Uh, you know, get all your nutrients in for those enzymes to work to break down histamine. Oh my gosh, and you does, know where my brain's going. Yeah, I know where your brain's going. Where's your brain going? Well, my brain's going directly to what we've been working on. That's yes. right. And, and again, we can't really talk about it. No. So the first no. rule of of Fight Club is we don't talk about Fight Club. No. But, <laughs> but it just and, and this is the frustrating thing. And this is, I guess, where, where our podcast we used to be able to talk about these things a little bit more freely, but we can't. But yeah. but that's fascinating. But yeah. basically, what I'm hearing the takeaway is is that looking after and having really good gut health is probably one of the first places to start with regards to this. Absolutely. Taking antihistamine would be symptomatic relief, but it doesn't fix the issue of too much histamine Correct. production, too much histamine release, too much estrogen production, and all of that. You know? uh, do, do we talk about the estrobolome here? The estrobolome is, is where microbes actually cause the recirculation of estrogen in the body. So it makes you estrogen dominant. So your gut microbes also regulate your hormone levels. So it's incredible. So we've got, we've got the test of bolome, we've got the estrobolome, and, and if you've got too much estrogen producing microbes, which... Basically, you detoxify estrogen, but these bugs cause it to be recirculated in the body. That's called estrobolome. And, and that's terrible for endometriosis because endometriosis is 
put very, very simply, too much estrogen, not enough progesterone because of the receptors. Right. And so, you know, you're getting, if your microbes are out and you've got too much estrogen producing microbes, then you're going to be in trouble. And Ooh. of course, those are the ones that feed off starches or high carbohydrate diets. And if you look at the symptoms that are associated with endometriosis, it's just absolute pain everywhere. We've got 15 symptoms here mm. and they're all to do with basically pain around the gut and everywhere, the back, everything, um, severe menstrual pain. And um, with all that extra histamine, um, then you get a more pain response. That's why antihistamines are used for pain relief sometimes. Mm. So it's, it's a real, and, and Elizabeth's is 100% right, we've got to get back to the cause of this stuff. And unfortunately, and, and I know you've got a bit there on um, normal orthodox treatments for um, endometriosis. Yep. So, so we can start there and then we'll work towards the herbal ones if well, you want. Yeah, and I was going to say, because I was actually just saying, tre- I've actually written down treatments here. So yeah. as far as um, uh, treatments in terms of ways to prevent it from happening, but also then, I mean, I've heard of surgery and stuff mm. like that as mm. well too. A friend, of a, a friend of mine's wife actually had it. And I don't know much about this, this at all, but he said it was almost like glass. I don't know where that sort of, like he said, it was so like um, uh, calcified or something yeah, like that. Right, and it becomes, yes. Yeah, but I, I, so what, what are the, the, the ways to treat it as far as either, um, well, I guess we could even talk about prevention, but I think most people that are listening to this with any interest is people that have maybe already got it yeah. and they're working out how do I treat it? Do I go for surgery? You know, what is, what is the doctors and the surgeons talking about? What about natural and hormones? What about all that sort of stuff? So do you want to run us through sort of... Absolutely. I think it's good to look at both treatment and prevention, but we'll start with treatment first. Mm, sure. And so the conventional treatment is, of course, surgery, because as Steve pointed out, a lot of that endometrial tissue uh, is outside of the uterus, and so you get these adhesions, mm-hmm. you know, onto the bladder and the bowels, and, you know, uh, it becomes extremely painful. So it, it is like, you know, just just kind of like um, connect, you know, just fusing the uterus literally to these other structures in the pelvic cavity. Right. And so the only real thing you can do there is surgery by right. actually removing that tissue. And then other kind of like interventions that they'll use is typically uh, anti things for pain relief, so anti-inflammatory. So that'll be like your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or aspirin or whatever is being prescribed to that person. Um, they'll sometimes look at blocking estrogen itself as well if they deem that that's a, a big issue as well so um, that's the the general kind of treatment mm-hmm. that or the conventional treatment that's followed if we look at it more from um, our perspective where we look more at working with the body you know then we'll also look at inflammation but we'll probably use more herbal anti-inflammatories like you know whether it be omega-3s or whether it be curcumin or turmeric or you know there's there's a wide variety of um Fever herbal view. anti-inflammatories mm. yeah think, and, and just, just going through them and I'll, I'll, i've mm. got an interesting paper here called pain in endometriosis right mm. and and they looked at surgery as an option and it said moreover and i'm just quoting this uh, chronic pain frequently returns in patients within 12 months of lesion removal even in the absence of lesion, uh, lesion regeneration so surgery may not be the answer mm. you can cut the endometrium out because it can Linger somewhere, but often the pain returns. Why does the pain return? Because the prob- tissue's gone? It, it could be just the fact of the, the there's some cells left over. Now you've got to remember that the, the endometrium, of course, bleeds once a month, okay, and swells and everything and bleeds. But if, it, if you get basically what like an internal bleeding, an internal swelling, so the pain is immense. And this could be anywhere in the anywhere body. in the body, even in the brain. Wow. So um, and usually it's in the perineal cavity, right. but it can, it can go anywhere in the body. So yeah, they get massive pain all around here, back, everything. It's terrible. So with regards to any of the forms of treatment, if somebody's got it um, and they're thinking, okay, surgery, is there any way to, to either live with it or remove it through medication, whether it be natural or, um, you know, drugs, pharmaceutical? Well, from you can't remove the tissue, tissue naturally. Right? There's yeah. no way that no, the body's going to clean it out. Like it's so, right. not, not, not that I'm aware of. Right. But um, depending on, of course, like how far it has 
advanced um you know uh, there is definitely a lot of things that women can do one of the things that i'll definitely tell women is like um you know be aware of whether foods make it worse because they may find that you know uh, J- uh Stephen pointed out um dairy earlier and apart from the hormones obviously in dairy it also is very high in uh igf1 right. the insulin growth factor 1 which is a proliferative hormone it makes things grow right mm. so it'll make the endometrial tissue grow if if um if you drink too much let's say cow's milk for instance uh, but even histamine foods you know some women may find that yeah you know when i drink too much alcohol apart from the fact that alcohol is estrogenic it's also a high histamine food mm-hmm. um or if i um you know eat a lot of cheese which is another fermented product then i feel worse mm-hmm. so it may be that their diet is too high in histamine foods which will kind of like perpetuate the cycle oh, that's interesting. um mm-hmm. For me the big thing is like you know I always go back to root cause okay what triggered this off in the first place and that's when we have to look at things like xenoestrogens as you pointed out um Jeff you know uh plastics and microplastics has infiltrated our environment so uh that obviously um puts us into this uh more estrogen dominant kind of state so that can then make young girls a lot more at risk for developing things like endometriosis but there's so many other chemicals um dioxins which is found in paper i believe mm-hmm. it's um paper yeah paper factories there's a lot of dioxin released there um oxidative stress is the number one now oxidative stress it's a very broad statement that's like saying someone has got chronic fatigue it's like okay well what does that mean it's a very broad statement mm. so oxidative stress is anything that triggers oxidation in the body and that will pretty much include any chemical any heavy metal any environmental chemical any infection anything that the body doesn't want uh will trigger off oxidative stress. So you really have to look at your environment. You really have to look at okay, am I living in a mining town? Do I have fillings in my teeth that may not be so good for me? Do I have infections, you know, gum uh oral infections? Do I have gut dysbiosis? Do I have anything that could be triggering oxidative stress? Of course, if you have a diet that's very low in antioxidants because it's you're eating McDonald's and you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables and polyphenol rich foods then you know that also is going to contribute this this such a long list of things that can contribute to this that is so basic and common sense but it's it's like our world has changed so much in the last you know I used to say last 50 years but I think it's now more like the last 100 years mm. I don't know um where we are exposed to all of these things that we can't really help too much of it anymore but these would would be things that I would say to women it, surgery is not the end all and be all you may have to get surgery to get the um tissue removed but just getting that removed and not fixing everything else that's mm. driving this in the background is not going to help you be the best that you can be or be the healthiest that you can be. You have to always go back and look at okay, well, where how did this start? What's the triggers? Am I still being exposed? How do I get rid of it? Um and that can sometimes be, I mean, it's really like a throwing a bit of a dart, like for one person it may be too much stress, for another person it may be a gut infection, for another person it may be something a toxin they were exposed to when they were younger. Uh it will really be a different thing for different people, which is why you don't treat everyone necessarily the same. There's some basic principles like inflammation you want to reduce, basic principles of balancing the estrogen and progesterone ratios for sure, uh you know stopping the aromatization. Uh we I think we've spoken a lot about aromatization before mm. where you know androgens gets converted into estrogen. Um so those are basics that should be done or looked at with any woman who's got endometriosis, but certainly go back and see if you can find the triggers for this because there would be a trigger you know um this was one of the interesting things one of the papers that Steve had you know that list all the causes one of them was genetics mm. and i thought yeah maybe it's worth us you know mentioning genetics because i think you guys already know how i feel about genetics yeah. you know looking for the endometriosis gene is definitely not in my opinion the answer i don't believe there is an endometriosis gene yeah. but we can look at genetics from a different perspective and say okay well there are so many avenues that can affect endometriosis like detoxification genes like histamine genes like estrogen genes so sure if we look at those genes maybe there are some genetic weaknesses there that makes you not metabolize estrogen as well or get rid of mercury as well or um not no no not get rid of histamine as well and that is going to play a role but it's not an endometriosis gene it's just 
looking at your biochemistry and where's your weak spots in your biochemistry. And maybe there are some weak spots there that you need to look at that then ties back to endometriosis. Uh, absolutely. And again, a, a standard treatments for endometriosis, because pain usually occurs when you menstruate in endometriosis. That's when the w- worst pain is. So what they often prescribe is two things, the contraceptive pill, and they don't give you the sugar pills. So you take 21 days of the pill and you start at your next cycle. So you never menstruate. And the second one is they treat with strong opioids during those short periods. Yeah, I know. Very strong opioids during those periods of, uh, and I'm, I've, I've even heard of pethidine shots, which is a very strong opioid. So the two, the, the thing that comes to, to mind then is the first option is, is a chemical straitjacket, which yeah. I, I always liken that to holding back the tide. Eventually, mm. you're mm. going to get yeah. overrun, and eventually, as we say, you have to pay the piper. Yeah. So um, unless you, th- that's again like a, a band-aid on a bullet wound. You, you need to get to the source. It's the same thing. If you're standing in the fire... Don't just stand there and throw water on yourself. Get it out of the fire, mm. right, or, or whatever you need to do. Then you can obviously go about treating it mm. and then hopefully, you know, find some relief and an ongoing improvement in life as opposed to consistently just trying to treat the symptom if we can actually remove it. The second one, Steve, obviously, what's the, what's the long-term effects of, of opioid use? First one is uh, down-regulation of the opioid receptors in the brain, so you need more of them. Right. And the second one is addiction. Um, and, and the third one is severe constipation, right. which makes endometriosis worse. So, so opioids slow down motility in the gut. Mm. So if, if you're on them, yes, it screws with your brain. It does cause, you know, you can become very addicted to these and you need more of them. So one, one day you might be on 50 milligrams of tap and tattle, which is a common opioid for this. Mm-hmm. And then they go, it's not working anymore. The pain's worse. Oh, we'll just take two of them, 100. Yeah. And then you're on 100 every, you know, four hours. And then you're addicted to it. And then you may step up to endone, which is all um, morphine. Mm. Um, you know, so, so you go through and then you go right up to the fentanyls and, and you start. Yeah, uh, yeah it's which a, is the epidemic they've got in the United mm, States. Absolutely. Mm. And, and so you become very addicted to them. And, and if you remember the. Um, so what does fentanyl do? Steve? It's a very strong mu opioid. So it's stronger mu. than, than mucindol. Way stronger. Really? It's 50 times stronger than morphine. Holy That's how wow. strong it is. It so is a, people are taking that. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit distracted. Yeah. I hear about fentanyl. Oh, my gosh, fentanyl, right? And all these people dropping dead in the United States with fentanyl. Yeah. It's because it's just like 50 times stronger than mesindol. Oh, than morphine. Than, morph- than, yeah. than morph- morphine. Now, now the problem with, <laughs> with, with fentanyl is you've got to remember it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drug used by medicine. Right. In fact, if you're having a day procedure, say, you know, you need lipo or something, that, you know, something that you don't want to be knocked out for. You don't need to be knocked nice, out. He's not very nice, is he? No, I, was just trying to think of what, I was trying to think about, <laughs> I was, was going to say something like a mild procedure in your bowel, and they use that for that too. But then I thought, no, lipo is a bit more politically correct. <laughs> but let's say let's say we need a bit of lipo. The, the most common drug you'd be given is fentanyl. Right. Uh, because, um, and midazolam, which which puts you in a state of um, haze. Twilight? Yeah, twilight sedation yeah. they call it. Yeah. So so you you're not you don't need help breathing, mm-hmm. but you're really not with it. Right. It's sort of like you're uh, out of it a bit. You can't feel anything. Sounds like a Monday morning. Yeah, it does sound like a Monday morning, yeah. but it also sounds like a recreational drug, doesn't it? It does. And so that's what fentanyl does, and it's very oh. cheap. Yeah. Um, you know, it's made in China very cheaply. It's sent to Mexico and then shipped into the US, and that's where they're, they're getting oh, it. How does it get across the border, Steve? Uh, <laughs> Nobody oh, knows. I don't know. We talk about I'd that. <laughs> anyway, to, yeah, but, uh, uh, but, moving right along. But, but <laughs> that, you know, unfortunately, the deaths in the US are now at 100,000 per, per annum on this. Oh, my gosh. The other side effects of. Don't uh, you think. I don't know. No. Anyway. I'll yeah. just do medicine. Yeah. It, it also suppresses your respiration rate. So if you take too much of it, you stop mm-hmm. breathing. Wow. Uh, and that's a very common cause. Oh I don't know if you ever heard someone at end of life and they're dying of cancer and then they die, just stop breathing and that sort of thing. They've, they've overdosed on morphine. Mm. And Dr. Doug did this. He told me a story once when he was treating someone <laughs> with an Irangangi sting. He gave them 10 milligrams of morphine and had to keep breathing for them until he got to the <gasps> hospital. He did it on purpose. He said, it's no big deal. He said, I, I allowed for that because of the pain they're in. And um, he had to keep breathing for. He didn't kill them. They survived fine. He just had to keep because because they suppressed their breathing so much. Stung by an irukandji with jellyfish. Jellyfish, yeah, which, he, is, he, which is way more worse than a box jellyfish, right? Yeah, pain, pain wise. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you know it's Mid-tiny right. Tiny little suckers. About a thumbnail size, yeah. they're invisible. Yeah. It happened because he, he used to live up Rockhampton. That's where he did most of his general practice. Yeah. So he used to go to the islands there and be the, the doctor there. So so that's how that's how that's what morphine can do. That was wow. ten milligrams. That was that was I think IV or IM. I think that you would have given it. So the fact that obviously it then increases constipation. Yeah. Um, 
that means that obviously you're not getting rid of the toxins out of the body quick mm. enough, which is, is, is and that the estrogens. The, so then it's recycling the, the and, and absolutely helping getting yep. the estrogens. It stuffs back your gut the, up dramatically. Right. So, so you got to remember, like, let's say a woman bleeds for five days yep. and they're on morphine or something like that for endo and whatever it is for five days. Mm. That really screws with your bowels. And then, of course, your next cycle is not 24, 28 days away, it could be 21 days away. Oh, gosh. And so, and you need more. More morphines. It's it's absolutely a, a, a terrible thing. Now, the the other thing about, of course, these 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 um, prescription drugs is they're hard to get. The doctors don't like handing out scripts of S eight because they're S eight drugs in Australia. Right. So they the the government keeps an eye on them. Yeah, fair enough. Because they're yeah yeah they're not S four, which means is like a an antibiotic. It's an S eight drug. It's a, it's a controlled substance. Mm-hmm. So it's they're very so. You know, someone could be suffering and and then there's open to abuse. So doctors are, you know, they remember the OxyContin with Purdue Pharma. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, that, that was marketed as a non-addictive opioid. It was and addictive. They always, yeah, well, proven in court. Mm. And um, unfortunately, um, it was it was published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine that it wasn't addictive. But you know, you know what they misquoted? It was a letter to the editor about them being in hospital, not addictive. So they're on it for two or three days post-surgery. They're not addictive. But if you're on it as an oral tablet for a sore back for three months, of course you're going to be addicted. So there's, there's real problems. You've got to manage the pain differently. Now, I know natural medicine, I, I, I think it's great. And, and one of the things that, that Elizabeth wants to, well, is going to talk about myriad of other herbs is resveratrol, which is an aromatase in here, but it also helps with pain control mm. yeah, and inflammation. Yeah, yeah so, so anything that kind of like reduces that aromatization, mm. like resveratrol, um, is um, you know very, very effective. I believe even EGCG, which is found in green, green tea, tea yeah. uh, I think that one was more like a, a, a VG, VEGF inhibitor. It kind of like stops that all those blood vessels from mm. forming and that proliferation kind of from happening. Mm. Um, uh, Genestin... Uh, I, I don't even know if Genistin? I pronounced it. That's yeah. right. Genistin and isoflavones, right, which is typically found in soy. soy. And I guess when we talk about soy, we're talking more about tofu mm. and that fermented soy uh, as opposed to soy milk and things like that. Mm. Uh, that's also, again, anti-angiogenic, if you wish. It kind of like stops all that blood vessel formation. It was definitely, you know, there's a lot of mechanisms involved in endometriosis, but I guess the one that really stood out for me was that VEGF angiogenesis mechanism, which is kind of like driven by histamine. Mm. Um, I'd say from a clinical perspective, I've had really good results when it comes to uterine pain disorders in in, in um uh, with uh, estrogen dominance uh, have had really, really good success when we address the histamine aspect. Mm. It, it's amazing like how like how many women can get off traditional painkillers if histamine uh, is under control. That is if histamine was an issue for them. I'm not necessarily saying that histamine is an issue for every single woman who has endometriosis or an estrogen dominant disorder, but it's definitely way underappreciated how much that is playing a role in um, hormone-related disorders. Because we can even go a little bit further, you know, uh, without getting too geeky. If you look at a woman's cycle, you know, if, you, if, if I go back to those histamine enzymes, there's the, the main one, there's two main ones, DAO and HNMT. Now, if you look at DAO enzyme in the uterus, its function changes depending on where you are in your cycle. So if you're in your first two weeks, which is that estrogen cycle, the follicular phase, that is when DAO enzyme is at its lowest. Mm. And that's where, so that means histamine builds up. Mm. And that's why a lot of women get more, more, you know, they feel worse mm. in that part of their cycle. They, they tend to feel better in their progesterone cycle because DAO enzyme function is faster. They break down more histamine. Mm. It's more progesterone. The progesterone stabilizes those histamine cells, all of that. So it's it's very clear when you start looking at women's symptoms that they that they cyc- cyclic symptoms follow the histamine mm. cycle as well. And so I just, for me, that's just, it should not be ignored as a huge contributing factor um, and maybe even you know we could argue a causative factor as well mm. if you look at like what's producing the histamine in the first place wow amazing i i just love the the, the biochemistry involved because histamine's involved in pain signals so these poor women get uterine problems but also exacerbated pain responses mm. so this is why we talk about the strong painkillers that they're, they're sort of 
you know, for some people necessary at certain times. So we have to acknowledge that there's people out there who are, who are taking strong painkillers for this, and and it's it's not a long term solution. And the doctor would admit that. Yep. It's not a long term solution. Well, we know that non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs affect the affect the gut, um, oh, you know, negatively. It can absolutely. cause, uh, I believe, long term use can cause bleeding. It does um, yeah? There, there's anti inflammatories inhibit COX enzymes, COX, cyclooxygenase. So, but be careful how I say that. So there's cyclooxygenase one and two. And then in one is the one that heals the gut. Mm. So if you stop healing the gut, the gut degrades. Right. And that's how the aspirin, the naprosins, the indices, the oridices, the, the feldines, the voltarins, those sort of things work in the body. Again, great short term, but then the Mobix and the Celebrexes are slightly more selective for COX-2, but still have problems with the gut. It's interesting. It sounds like a lot of the um, weapons of war against this seem to have a sh- good short-term benefit that improves, I guess, the, the feeling and well-being of the, the patient, but long-term is, is, is again, going to cause this more, a, more problems. This is a long-term condition. Elizabeth's approach to treating it naturally in histamine is vastly superior because it's addressing the underlying causes. Have you, have you got any... Um, good successes in terms of, you, you know, maybe some people that you've worked with to be able to get off medication and sort of yeah. go back to a more improved quality of life, if not back to normal? Absolutely. So, you know, I've, I've treated women with endometriosis. I've treated women with, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I've also treated uh, women with uh, adenomyosis, which is kind of like a slightly different. And um, uh, a lot of those women were able to, yeah, they don't use painkillers anymore. Great. They may still get like, you know, a little bit of discomfort during their during their period, but I mean, these are women who have had to be on strong painkillers for four or five days, mm. couldn't go to work, you mm. know, just completely incapacitated. You know, um, luckily I've never experienced anything like that, so I can't imagine how that must feel for some women. But uh, it, it does; it, it, it's complete debilitation where they just can't function, and we've been, we've been able to get them off medications completely. Mm. Before, Incredible. We, before we finish, and I appreciate you might have some more to go through, but I'd love to do sort of maybe a, a checklist or things to consider if someone's listening to this or got a family member in terms of diet, um, you know, in, in terms of short term and then sort of longer term treatment as far as you see this obviously from a you know naturopathic point of view but also even using conventional western medicine as well too because i know that you guys are familiar with that um but yeah i'd like to sort of run through maybe a bit of a checklist and maybe things that people can consider and then go and talk take that to their healthcare professional Mm. whoever that may be as a point of discussion so not treatment because uh, as you said before i think it's really important that everybody is treated by a professional who looks at their individual circumstances. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is always, and I know that we've got the disclaimers at the beginning of the website, this is for discussion purposes, this is for things of interest and education to be able to take to your healthcare practitioner. Please don't self-medicate or, or self-treat. Go and talk to your healthcare professional. So I just wanted to state that. But I think there's some good points that... I want to raise at the end of this podcast that people can actually take to that healthcare professional and say, hey, I've heard this. Uh, does this make sense? Could we try this? And then you've got somebody who can actually monitor you and, and give you feedback and obviously adjust things because there is not one size fits all. Absolutely. As a human being, we all have different things going on. As you said, you know, whether that be external sources, like you might be exposed to certain chemicals or toxins or xenoestrogens or whatever it may be. You may have your own individual polymorphisms as well too. But if we can look at some of those things, that might be a good place for some people to start. It's a start. A great place to start is three ways I see. And firstly, you stop smoking. That's good for everybody, oh, okay. yep. but it's good for endometriosis. Second thing is start exercising. Well, That's also smoking back the endometriosis? It drives the inflammatory process and free radicals mm. um, and all sorts of other things we won't go into. Um, exercise is highly beneficial yep. um, for this. And also not just cut back on the drinking. This is one of those ones where you have to cut out the drinking. Zero. Yeah, unfortunately. Yep. I don't like to say Even that. Even red wine, Steve, yep. Even red wine, because yep. of the amount of alcohol is 10 grams is a risk factor. Because I always look at it's red wine much. and go, oh, a bit of resveratrol if it's natural and there's no anything. But, for, but for I agree yeah. with you, alcohol, right? Yeah, because for this one. The day, it's, it's effectively, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm the layperson here, but but it seems it would be like absolutely putting petrol onto a fire. In this case, mm. it would be. If yep. you're an average person who's healthy, you can, sure. you can have a, a few. Bit. Yeah, yep. it's fine. But this one of the ones is a, is no. a real risk factor because of the estrogenic mm. potential. And I, and I remember, the, I think I only treated one person with endometriosis, and I just gave them loads of Vitex, 
because I, I, I knew back in the olden Agnes days. Castus. Yeah, yeah, that's one of yeah, the right. herbs. That's yeah. Well, I was going to talk about the anti-estrogen side of it and where it yeah. fits into the antihistamine and the gut health and then when you would look at using sort of estrogen detoxifiers, which mm. of course can be very beneficial, but, mm. but one out. And this is where almost, and again, we can sort of get into these these these, if you like, and I'm going to put in, in bunny ears here, sort of treatment protocols that you might consider or work mm. with your health practitioner on. Yeah, That's one, and rosemary was another good one I found. In the literature, it came up pretty good too, rosemary. Yeah, yeah broccoli sprouts is a very oh, good yeah. one for that estrogen conversion, um, you know, because it's often not the estrogen itself. It's, it's actually the, the, the sec- secondary estrogen metabolites that are often more estrogenic than estrogen itself. And that's where things like uh, um, the diindole methane in broccoli sprouts is very effective in mm. kind of like clearing those estrogen metabolites specifically um, mm. or, or, or at least converting it into the more um, – the less potent, potent. form. Like the two hydroxyls. So salt water, the, yeah. Do, so the three indole carbonyl or something like that, isn't yep. it? But, but in terms of the different forms of estrogen as well too, I guess, do you know, just, just quickly, because this is, again, part of, I guess, the, the outworkings of, uh, you know, the endometriosis and how the body deals with estrogen. Um, the most potent form is the 16... 16 hydroxy yeah. estrogen. That's the one. Yeah. And, and uh, four, and four hydroxy, hydroxy are the bad ones. Right, yeah. and they're like really, really mm. potent... Um, uh, if, if you like to say, um, like chemically active, I yep. guess, right? Yeah. So the, the body has a hard time detoxifying those and removing those, and, and obviously then it perifl- proliferates. Is that right? So it actually… they proliferative estrogen metabolites. Yes. So they promote, promote proliferation. Yes. Whereas the 2-hydroxy estrogen is yep. your, your health… Beneficial estrogen Good for metabolite. Bones, isn't it? Good mm. for bones. That one sort of like gets cleared through the methylation cycle in the liver through the COMT enzyme. Mm. But it is those other ones, the sixteen and the four, and the the broccoli sprouts can kind of like change that conversion ratio away from the sixteen and four to w- more towards the two hydroxy mm. estrogen, which what is are, what we want. What are some other foods that you'd recommend for that? Because we, we've spoken about broccoli, kale. kale. Mm. Now you've got to be careful, yeah. with kale, don't you, because of um, <laughs> The thyroid. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and you can actually end up getting goiter if you have too oh, much If you have kale way too much kale. raw kale. No, no, I knew a girl that was literally having kale smoothies every day and basically stuffed her, her thyroid, yeah. Mm. Wow. So, so a little bit's good, but again, it's pretty much like everything, right? What, else, what else is good for Well, you? I would say having soluble fibers, getting a healthy gut going. So right. starting to eat those and eating rich polyphenols. Yeah. Rich foods, so all the spices and herbs and those sort of things, like, very very healthy for your gut. Sort of stuff yes, yeah, cinnamon, nutmeg. Well, absolutely, because I, I believe that the three indole carbonyl uh, gets con- f- that you get from broccoli and all mm. those you know cabbage and all the, uh, the sulf- all those sulfurous, so, so sulfur vegetables yep. gets converted into the di- indole methane, methane in the gut. It does oh. yeah. and you need certain gut bacteria to do that, mm. and then you get the good stuff. Mm. Which is why kind of Tony and I were talking about this the other day, sort of like you've got two people and one person starts taking either a supplement or changes their diet to incorporate, say, you know, this broccoli, broccoli sprout or, or whatever it may mm. be, they get great results. And then somebody else does it and they get nothing. And they're like, hey, how come it work for you, not for me? It's because you're right. This the <laughs> person A might have had really good, you know, microbiome and gut to be able to actually utilize that, mm. whereas the other person's got deficiencies that can't actually actually activate or utilize it effectively. Yeah. Yep. So I'd recommend seeing a big brain like Elisma to, to get all this sorted out because, yeah, you know, are you still in practice? I didn't ask you this before. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still in practice. Selectively. <laughs> Selectively. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I should have asked that before the podcast. But but you really need a practitioner to sort this, where you fit into this scale because it's a real complex disease. Mm. It's not like losing weight, which is kind of, yeah, there's different ways of doing it, but you can sort of manage on your own. This one's a tricky one, and you're dealing with a potentially very serious disease that disables you for five days a month. Yeah. And, and we, we have to remember, you know, this is what I – with all diseases – you can get the surgery and you can mask all of the symptoms with painkillers. It doesn't change the metabolic things that's happening in the background. So mm. you may get rid of the endometriosis, but it will pop up somewhere else in your life mm. in the next couple of years with some other symptoms because we need to look at disorders, whether it's endometriosis or anything else. There is a dysregulation in the biochemistry that needs to be corrected. Mm. If you just mask the symptoms, yeah, you'll feel okay, but it's going to pop up somewhere else because th- th- you haven't fixed the biochemical imbalance in your body. We really need to kind of like look at that. Absolutely. And and you, you can't mask it. And, and unfortunately, the masking agents for these are, uh, are strong hormones and strong painkillers. And, and they're just no good long term. 
they're really, really no good long term. You know, it's a. Uh, so there's actually specific gut bacterial species that has been associated with endometriosis. That's Klebsiella. Right. <laughs> No, Not no, Klebsiella, but you're close. E, uh, Escherichia e. coli or E. coli. Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. E. coli, which is, a lipo, which is a lipopolysaccharide producer, the same as Klebsiella. Streptococcus species, which is a lipopolysaccharide producing bacteria, the same as Klebsiella. Right. I believe it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yes, yeah. okay. All right, I just had a, wasn't sure if I was right there. Enterobacteria and proteobacteria as well. So these are like four big species that have been, it's in one of the papers that we've got here that mm. has been been um, associated with endometriosis. Mm. So uh, all four of those or two of those you mentioned were, I always say LPS, but mm. lipopolysaccharides. Producers. Now the only thing I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that they are Inf- like ridiculously inflammatory, right? Like the, like effectively the most inflammatory things that are normally floating around in our body. Is that right? Well, they're an endotoxin, meaning that's a toxin that bacteria produce. Right. It is very, very inflammatory. Right. Um, it's been associated with metabolic syndrome and all kinds of metabolic disorders, right. and it's also associated with leaky gut. Wow. Um, so um, it's – when I see – I guess in my clinic, when I see people with lipopolysaccharide-producing bacteria, they generally do have a lot of pain syndromes and a lot of, you know – um, they gut if, is affecting them more than, than others because you can always like you know test someone's gut bacteria and there's like things there that shouldn't be there but they're not really experiencing many symptoms mm. I'd have to say every single client I've ever had with lipopolysaccharide producing bacteria had very very strong gut symptoms so it does it's very um yeah, it's de- definitely very problematic. And just a plug for the next week's podcast, if you're really interested for us to do a deep dive into your gut, well, that yeah. doesn't sound good, um, and, and really get in there, we're going to absolutely just get into gut health. And it's interesting because I know that we're sort of talking about it in its relationship with endometriosis, and I know people are fascinated about the gut, and I'm really looking forward to next it's week's podcast. It's a great one. Got to it's, there's yeah. going to be some stuff in there that's just going to blow your mind, and hopefully for the average person like me, demystify the gut. Because everybody knows you need a good gut. But what does that mean? What yeah. does that look like? What's the expression of that? And how do you actually achieve that? Some of the absolute things you should avoid and some of the absolute things you should do. Anyway, just a little plug for next week's podcast. So, Do you remember absolutely. the name of the next week's podcast? No, no idea. So oh, you know we, it's, it's something bad. I don't know if we can say it. Can up we say bum. it? That's it. What's up your bum? Yeah. Well, that's great. <laughs> because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we're all... That'll be different for every single person. It will be. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, there's no comment on that moving one. Is right it? No, yeah, moving, moving right along. <laughs> so, so look, we're, we're, the great thing about endometriosis is that we're starting to learn more about it. Right. The retrograde stuff we, we, is, is the theory now. We know the risk factors for it. Well, there's now natural medicine treatments that are very good for it. But the, the problem is it's very complex yep. and very debilitating and affects 10% of people. So you need, unfortunately, to see someone like Elisma. So, Elisma, unfortunately. in summary... And I know that there's been a lot of information and people who have got endometriosis are probably being taking some notes, but can we just summarise from diet through to treatment uh, and things to avoid? Could you just give maybe a a two, three-minute overview on the things that you should definitely do and the things you should absolutely stop doing? Yep. All right. So in terms of diet, definitely uh, a high, rich antioxidant diet. Now, what does that mean? Probably something like a Mediterranean-style diet that's rich in polyphenols and omega-3s. Yeah, and are polyphenols the, are found in what? Polyphenols found in a lot of the, the skins in fruits and vegetables. It's kind of like what's responsible for a lot of the, the colors that we have in our fruits and vegetables. So rule of thumb, the more colorful a vegetable and fruit is, probably the higher the p- polyphenol content. So mm. you can think of you know, the, the beautiful red pomegranates. I love, I knew, um, I was going to say, I love pomegranates. The purple broccoli. eat some of the pith as well too. There's some mm. great benefit there as well. Absolutely. So the more color there is in your vegetables, the more polyphenols. And we don't, we, we're not really eating enough of these types of foods. So that's from a diet perspective. That will reduce inflammation in your body. It'll keep your gut microbiome healthy and stop all that excess histamine being produced, mm-hmm. stop the leaky gut, mm-hmm. improve the estrobilome that uh, Steve spoke about earlier. So from a dietary perspective, that's what you need to do more, more of. of. Yeah. Uh, what you want to do less of is you definitely want to be looking at exposure to xenoestrogens, plastic. Plastics, microplastics. Uh, there's a don't there's a, don't don't use plastics in the microwave and heat. No, eat your food in the microwave, plastic especially water in plastics. Right? Absolutely. Plastic water bottles. I forget about that. Plastic yeah. water bottles is a big one. This is a bit of a doozy. It's uh, it's a it's a study, a Norwegian study uh, that I read about 
a year or two ago, and they did an experiment on tea bags where they boiled, they took the leaves out of tea bags, it was just empty tea bags, and they would boil water and put empty tea bags in a cup as if they were going, as if they're making a cup of tea. And they did that with different tea, tea brands, and they measured the amount of microplastics, and they found that if you drank one cup of tea a day made from a tea bag, Within a month, you consume the amount of plastic equivalent to a credit card. No, Why? oh my god! Yep. So microplastics are everywhere, people. Man, you everywhere. Know what? I just, I almost always use loose leaf tea, and I've got these little tea there strainers. You go. Do you remember? And I used to in New Zealand, we used to pour our our tea into a kettle, and it was one for each person drinking, and then one for the pot member, and then you'd let it stand, and then mm-hmm. you'd sit there with your tea strainer, and oh my gosh, you didn't strain out the the, the tea as well. Right now, I've got these personal little ones that we do, but I got lazy and I actually went and bought tea bags. (laughs) Now I'm going to throw those tea bags out. It's apparently the glues. It's the glue ah. that they use in the tea bags. It's like a soft plastic, Man, apparently. I never would have I've, I've so been stitched up. It's you, you know, we think of the obvious. Yeah. There is so many non-obvious sources wow. that we that we get exposed to. So those were the things, you know, try and stop doing that. Look at your water filtration systems. Uh, you know, just and just remove as many chemicals as you can from your food and from your exposure, you know, whether it's you know, like I said, uh, fillings in your teeth, which is a more I had all mine removed. exposure. I had Good. all mine removed and put porcelain in. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. and, and look, literally, Same I don't yeah. leave it. But if I showed you what my mouth was like, because I got terribly soft teeth, um, and I was very unhealthy when I was younger, I was stupid. Um, my teeth, uh, almost every tooth has a filling in it. Wow. Except for the front ones. And even the front ones have actually got fillings in them too because I overbrushed them then and tried to overcompensate. But, yeah, I removed all of them and put mm. porcelain and stuff. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a much, much I've better got no option. mercury. Yeah. I, I remember as a chemist, you know, I found out that there was mercury in fillings. And I thought it was horrific because I was we were licensed to handle mercury. And we, we used to have to put it in this big jar with oil on top of it in the fume hood mm. with the thing down with it on mm. all the time. That was the only safe space you're allowed to store the mercury or in your mouth. Well, the funny mm. thing is, is I got absolutely chastised. I was probably, I was just learning yeah. about health when I was sort of in my sort of early 20s and I had to get a filling done. And I said, oh, can you, can you, um, you know, use a, a white one? Because I don't want the, and it was here. Yeah. Right at the front. And he goes, oh, you're just vain. And he chastised and I'm like, no, mm. no, 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 I want it for Oh man, he thought I was a crack. Yeah. I mean, talk about tinfoil harrowing about conspiracy theories. Like, Ooh. ah, you get more more mercury in a tin of tuna than what you. Yeah, but you're not constantly micronizing it and actually breathing it in. It's, it's not, not constantly con- in your mouth. You don't right. eat tuna every single day, twenty four hours a day. The, the so. fun thing about mercury is it's poorly absorbed in the gut. But if you use your teeth for chewing, I do, it, Steve. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you do. <laughs> Uh, the mercury is released as a vapor. It's it. got a bo- boiling temperature of negative 37 degrees. So it vaporizes oh. and goes in your lungs yeah, and gets absorbed it. through your lungs. Yeah, yeah. Tuna, you don't breathe in your lungs. Some of the other, one of the other things that we did as well too was the Asia syndrome as well too, which is interesting around um, implants. And, and again, we've done a podcast on that, which may be of interest to you as well. And these are the sorts of things, mm. again, for our regular listeners, you may have heard or considered these sorts of things. But if you've got an underlying health condition and or something that's just consistently just you, you're doing all these things, Breast implants, yes, have a look at one. research Asia syndrome. In fact, jump on and have a look on the ATP project on the podcast. I think mm. we did it. Yeah. And, uh, are your boobs making you sick or something? I can't remember <laughs> what it was called. Um, but, yes, that the Asia syndrome could be yep. something as well. Look anyway. for anything that's in your body that shouldn't be there, mm. um, you know, any kind of like exposure to those. And, the, and gut health. Oh, you know, mm. I can ca- carry on about gut health. Be one of the – again, Definitely. we're going to carry on next week. It's probably one of the most important things, which is, yeah. again, guys, if you listen to this podcast – and you're really interested, um, you know, for overall health, including endometriosis, but anything else, let's start at the gut, which is where we're going to sort of start with with next next week. Yep. Um, and also, obviously, hormones in your food as well too. Now, I know yeah, you mentioned yeah. milk was a big one, Steve. I know you hate milk. He bashes milk at any chance he any gets. Any chance I get. Anything else? I think that pretty much sums and it up. And then gut, and then we want to look at anti um I shouldn't say anti-estrogens. It's really important that you don't go anti-estrogens, that you go estrogen detoxification. Estrogen mm. modulators. modulators. So ba- you want to balance your hormones. Yeah, yep. plenty of good, clean yep. water. We drink, you know, mm. t- tambourine water, which is, comes from streams, which, you know, again, a lot of people use water filtration systems on their tap. It means pure that, water. Right? But, um, and uh, lifestyle. Go Stress. and watch some funny movies. Go out for a nice long walk, you know, with your, your partner and just enjoy life a little bit. De- 
unplug for a little bit, you know. Absolutely. Well, stress is made, a stress hormone cortisol is made from progesterone. Yeah. So if you yeah. want to deplete your progesterone, yeah. stress. That's right. And then, and then if you look at stress even further, stress depletes the nutrients that you need for those uh, enzymes to break down histamine and for the enzymes to break down estrogen. Yeah, of course. So if you're constantly under chronic stress, you're, you're not going to have enough nutrients to do those things. Do you know, it's so funny. I'm just thinking about so many of our podcasts where we're talking about different disease states and all the rest of it, and there's about 80% commonality okay. in terms of eat good, clean, healthy, local foods that are in season, mm-hmm. plenty of polyphenols, and, and remove any of the xenoestrogens, good quality water, um, good quality air, <laughs> um, remove yourself from stressful situations as much as you possibly can, or at least have some good downtime, get some really good quality sleep so that your body can detoxify as well too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's probably making up 80% of yeah. it. If you just do those exercise, and avoid don't smoke exercise, alcohol. don't smoke, avoid excess of alcohol, in this case, avoid alcohol completely. Yeah. I mean, and the funny thing is, is that I think realistically that would be 80% oh, of, yep. of, of absolutely. We'd be out of a job. Yeah, we would be. Probably. If everybody did that on this earth, yeah. uh, we'd, it would go oh, a lot of disease would be history. Yeah. It you, really you, you would, would be. definitely cut down on a lot of chronic Obesity would be gone. Yeah. You know, like refined you know. sugars. I mean, if oh. we those, you know, again, it, just those simple things. I know if mm. we did more of that, then yeah, I think everyone would be healthier. Anyway, guys, mm. Was there anything else you want to finish off with? I think we're good. I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks, guys. If you've got any questions, please, we love to hear from you. Email us in. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, write a comment down below. Um, you know, it, it's fantastic when we hear from you. We, we love your feedback. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe as well too. And I, I appreciate you probably hear that all the time is bang, bang, all. But it does obviously help us a lot to get the message out there. And if you enjoy these podcasts and you want to, share them with other people please go ahead um and we'll be back next week with gut health so lisma we're doing a two-parter we're going to record it right now but it's going to be out the following week so if you're interested in gut health you know anyone that's interested in gut health listen to the next week's podcast yep all right all right see you next week see you next week bye